All right, so good uh, morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are particularly excited because all February long, we are showcasing incredible women in science from across the globe. We're picking out all the men and only featuring amazing women over 50 sessions this month. And it's all because of today. Today, February 11th, is the International Day of Women in STEM. So thank you guys so, so much for joining us. And we're really looking forward to getting started today with a great presentation. So right now, we're joined by four classes from across North America. I'm going to give them a chance to say hi and do a bit of a shout out. And then we're going to dive in with our speaker. So we're on a big delay with this group, so I'm just going to introduce them and then I'll go to our other classes. We've got Miss Elliott's grade sixes in Dallas, Texas joining us. So we're really excited to have a Texas class in. You guys always are the most enthusiastic and I love it. We've got Miss Gruss's grade sixes in View Cyrus in Kansas. Hi guys. Hey! Hey, welcome in. <laughs> We've got Miss Keller's grade fours in Hutchinson in Kansas. Hi guys. Let's get them. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome in. And last but not least, we've got Miss Collins grade fives in Rhinebeck in New York. Hi guys. Hey, welcome in. All right, of course, the reason you guys are all joining us is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Carleton Place in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada by Jill Heinert. So she is the Royal Canadian Geographical Society's Explorer in Residence. She is a best-selling author of Into the Planet, currently out right now. And she is the world's greatest cave diver. She has explored more places than pretty much any speaker we've ever brought in to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants and has done many sessions with us over the last few years. But today's is really special even by that standard. She is just back, literally yesterday, from an expedition to Truck Lagoon, one of the most remote and amazing sites in the whole world. And I'm not going to spoil it anymore because I am going to turn it over to Jill. Thank you so, so much for joining us, Jill. And take it away and explain just how you got to this amazing place and what it's all about. Okay. Yeah, my pleasure. It's it's great to be with you all. Um, as Jesse was saying, I literally just got home from two and a half days on an airplane getting back from Micronesia. And so I'm gonna share with you some images and some stories that you probably haven't heard of because they just happened. <laughs> so I'm gonna hit my um, screen share here and uh, hopefully, uh, Oops, let's see. Yep, there we go. Oops, share. And are you able to see that, Jesse? That looks great. Okay, awesome. So yeah, I am an underwater explorer and uh, I live up here in Canada and travel all over the world for my work. Um, sometimes you will find me inside uh, icebergs in Antarctica. Sometimes you might find me camping on top of the sea ice in the Arctic. This is the Northwest Passage. You might find me uh, working with scientists collaborating on exciting new mapping technologies, including things like underwater mapping robots or swimming deeper into the earth than any woman has before. And you may even find me roaming in the Sahara Desert, um, in fact, looking for dive sites. And even places like the Sahara Desert have some amazing and weird dive sites. But you'll also find me in places like this, like underneath the Ural Mountains in, uh, in Russia, diving in the world's longest gypsum cave, or inside the Mount uh, Corona volcano in Lanzarote in the Canary Islands, because there are caves there too. And underwater caves are my specialty. These beautiful places are like museums of natural history uh, that contain uh, amazing information about global climate change. It's a place where we test technologies that are destined for space. And there's spaces where um, past cultures have left behind the remains of their, of their civilizations uh, as, as doorways to the next world or their underworld. So for me, I shoot programs for TV channels. I work with scientists collaborating and being their hands and eyes in places they can never go. I um, shoot underwater photography, write stories, write books, um, speak and do all kinds of things that keep me in the place that I love the most, underwater. But the expedition I just came back from yesterday 
was exploring a place called Chuk Lagoon, or some people call it Truck Lagoon. And this is a place where World War II shipwrecks have turned into marine biodiversity hotspots. Now, to give you a sense of where Chuk is, that little red flag on the map will show you that it's kind of north of Papua New Guinea in the South Pacific Ocean. And it took me two and a half days to get there and two and a half days to get home. If I zoom in on that a little bit more, you can see Truck Lagoon itself. It's called a lagoon because it's actually an atoll. So it's um, inside the rim basically of an ancient volcano. And this was a very interesting place in World War II history. So in World War II, um, actually, I wonder if I can just get rid of the sidebar here for a moment. There we go. Yeah, in um, World War II, on 1941, I'm sure you've heard of the attack on Pearl Harbor. So that's when the Japanese carried out a surprise attack on the American fleet ships that were based in Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. And in 90 minutes, the Japanese Navy destroyed seven American battleships, 90 support ships, and 250 aircraft. Um, so uh, that was a, a huge, huge um, thing in America. And that's what brought the US into World War II. Now, as a revenge, a couple of years later, the Americans attacked the Japanese fleet that was parked in Truck Lagoon. And so this was a, a huge assemblage of ships all inside that lagoon hiding in the South Pacific. And so this Operation Hailstone was um, basically the revenge for Pearl Harbor. And today, the ships that were sunk in Operation Hailstone um, are all concentrated in this little area. And these ships have become not just important historic sites, but also um, a natural refuge for marine life that tends to recruit and, and uh, attach itself to these, these remains of the ships. Now, just to give you an idea of the kinds of ships that were, were diving in the lagoon, here's a picture of the Haiyan Maru. Maru basically means merchant ship. And so besides warships at a time of war, you need lots of supply ships to uh, bring the goods that are necessary, like the food, the water, the clothing, the bombs, the ammunition, all need to be transported. And so those are transported sometimes on ships that were never built by the military. They're actually seized by the military. And so you have ships that were made for other pur purposes that are brought into the war effort. And in the Japanese uh, nomenclature naming system, marus are merchant ships. So there's a lot of these merchant ships underwater. So the high-end Maru was a big ship, like 510 feet long. It was actually an ocean liner before the war and had been you know, brought in uh, mainly to serve the needs of submarines. So it was a submarine depot ship. And this is actually the name of the boat underwater that I photographed. Today, this, this particular long ship lays on its side. It was bombed by aircraft um, and inside the ship, we still find a lot of things, um, everything from um, shells like explosives and torpedoes to periscopes that were used for uh, submarines. And when we swim inside the ship, we find things like this medicine kit. So this medicine kit has been sitting underwater with bottles full of medicines um, since 1944. The outside of these wrecks um, are very attractive to marine life. And so sponges and corals and al algae colonies all recruit and attach to the metal of the ship and grow quite prolifically. So outside the ship, it's like a living, beautiful reef. And then inside the ship, you get more of the bare rusting walls of the ship. So we do get things like rusticles that actually um, grow inside these spaces. But since it's completely void of daylight, there are less things that actually grow inside the ship. 
but we do look at artifacts and things that were left inside the ship and have remained there ever since the sinkings. So these spaces, whether you're inside or outside, are quite beautiful. Um, this is my friend Pam, who's, who's diving and lighting up some, some broken pottery, basically, on the, the floor there. Here, uh, my buddy Pam is actually lighting up what's called the ship's telegraph. So this is the thing that transmits the order, um, maybe from the bridge down to the engine room or back. So you can imagine the captain saying, you know, full speed ahead. And that is actually transmitted mechanically through this telegraph. And these can also help with orders for how to dock the ship or emergency um, commands as well, like full reverse if they're just about to hit something. So they're transmitted from the bridge to the engine room. So the last shot was the engine room. And then here is a telegraph on the bridge. And the captain might have grabbed that handle to say, you know, full ahead or full back or quarter speed or something like that. Also in the ship, we find large um, torpedoes. So on the left, that's a torpedo that's actually stacked. Um, it's vertical now, but that's because the ship's on its side. And what you're seeing at the very top is actually the, the propeller that would have moved the torpedo through the water. On the right, you're seeing very large artillery shells that were loaded into big guns that could be shot to, to sink ships or to fire at aircraft. Here's another boat. This is the Nippo Maru. And so this is quite a different looking uh, ship, but also a, a merchant um, supply ship. Um, and then sometimes in, in these places, we find things like this, like huge piles of beer bottles and sake bottles because food has to be transported to soldiers um, and so does drink. And so in these days in 1944, it would have all been delivered in individual glass bottles. Now on the Nippo Maru, it's a little bit deeper. We don't have quite as much marine life, but still a lot of really colorful stuff. And fish move in because the sponges and the corals all uh, grow on the ship as well. So it really does become a beautiful reef. Here's the outside of the Nippo Maru, the very deepest part. And that's my buddy actually swimming through the hole that was created by a bomb that sunk the ship. So this is the size of the hole that sunk that ship. Now we also find lots of smaller sort of more personal artifacts on these ships like gas masks. There are lots of gas masks scattered around on the ship, even you know, piled up in the debris field inside the holds of the ship. So pretty interesting stuff. On deck, we still find field guns. This is a, a, a smallish field gun that could have been put ashore to um, move around and, and uh, shoot at things. Uh, this was on the deck and sort of pointing upwards, perhaps it was even involved in shooting at the airplanes that were trying to down that ship. And this gives you a little sense of scale in terms of a diver beside that, um, that particular gun. We also find things like this three-man tank. So this is a very small tank, but this was um, large enough for three Japanese soldiers to have been inside of that. And now it's all coated with um, crested marine life. And again, that's back inside the bridge of the Nippo Maru. Now you can see the, tel the telegraph um, and what we call the binnacle. And this circle that you're seeing is, a, is the wire hoop that would have had the ship's wheel in it. So the smaller gear that you see inside of that larger hoop would have had um, wooden um, spokes sticking out of it and it would have attached to that larger hoop. So that would have been the ship's wheel and all the, the wood has, has disappeared and rotted away. And so we only have the metal remains that are now coated with this colorful marine life. And on top of what looks like a, a head there, you've got like, like two gauges that look like eyes and where the top of the head would be, that's actually an indicator that would have been showing you like the speed that they were traveling at. So here's another type of ship that we see. And this was actually painted more in camouflage colors. This is the Fujikawa Maru. 
And um, this ship was like 437 feet long. So to give you an idea, like a four to 500 foot long ship might take us 10 minutes to swim the length from the bow to the stern. That means there's a lot to explore. And on this ship, there are even aircraft inside um, the hold of the ship. So lots to see. Uh, here is uh, actually the cockpit of one of the zero Japanese aircraft that was you know, used to bomb ships. And so what you're seeing inside there is the seat and where the gauge console kind of rotted away. And on the right, you're seeing a compressor that's down in the engine room. And I, I photographed that because it, it looks like R2-D2 and we actually called it R2-D2. <laughs> now, in some of the larger parts of the ship, you have great big open holds that were used for supplies. And, and like I said, coral and sponges and sea fans growing on everything. On the right-hand side of this photo, you're actually looking at a lifeboat davit. So something that would have hung a lifeboat. And this is a large anti-aircraft gun. And you can see a couple of divers underneath just to give you a sense of scale. The coral growth on these wrecks is quite remarkable. So this has had a chance to grow for, um, you know, since 1944 and it's quite abundant. And then the, the life besides the fish life, there's a lot of other things living inside these wrecks like this big sea cucumber. Um, we also saw sharks and rays and many larger animals in the area as well. Uh, and it's because of this, this marine life. If you go down to the seafloor, it's kind of a sandy bottom, but all of this marine life has something to grow on. And so it's a substrate that creates this incredible artificial reef. And sometimes there's so much life and color that you can't even see the wreck itself underneath. So for the diving, uh, we were using some advanced technologies because these were deeper dives, dives that we call technical dives. And rather than traditional scuba gear, where you take a breath in from a tank and you exhale and make bubbles, we were actually using um, rebreathers. So a, a piece of equipment that recycles the bubbles that we would normally exhale. So it recaptures the exhaled bubbles within the life support system. Uh, scrubs the carbon dioxide out of our exhaled breath, and then injects small bits of oxygen back into the breathing loop so um, that we're, we're basically recycling all of that gas and able to use it again and again. So a rebreather is pretty much akin to what you would use to make a spacewalk from the International Space Station. And when we use a rebreather, we still take lots of gas tanks with the appropriate mixed gases that allow us to do deep dives. We use computers on our wrists that help us keep track of, of the life support gases and the time that we're underwater. And then for me, I also carry underwater cameras, movie cameras or still cameras and lights in order to light up these dark environments. Um, but the environments are stunningly beautiful as I think you'll, you'll probably agree. Uh, so I'm just going to stop the screen share here and uh, open up so that we can ask some questions and anything goes like if you want to ask me about underwater exploration or specifically about truck lagoon or underwater caves or underwater life support or or if I'm scared <laughs> anything like that goes so common we'll question. Talk. well yeah. Jill that was an incredible presentation and again I want to stress to our classes live and on YouTube like I think, are, are we the first people to see that other than the people that you've mm -hmm. sent us to? Like, we're the first people ever to see that presentation. Yeah, That's literally, cool. yeah, literally, I was like doing photographs and um, putting my presentation together on the planes in the last couple of days. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much. And so for our live classes, and we've got a bunch of groups on YouTube, including this Cats Goes class, grade fives in Calgary. Uh, awesome. If you guys want to type in questions on YouTube, please do. We'll take as many as we can. But we are going to start uh, with Miss Collins' class. If you guys want to kick us off and come up for a question, go right ahead. Sure. Okay, yeah. Um, Sam, you have a question? Um, nice and loud. What was your favorite place to go diving? Um, you know, my favorite place is actually the west coast of Canada around Vancouver Island. So um, we have 
big like sea lion colonies that I photographed there. We have wrecks, we have a really healthy marine life. So I really enjoy that. Um, some of my favorite caves are in the Bahamas because they're really, really beautiful. And um, Antarctica is swimming inside an iceberg was one of my favorite places. <laughs> And we, again, we're going to pass along some of your past yeah. presentations or classes. So if they want to hear about these adventures in more detail, they yeah. can. Great. Have a great question to kick us off. Let's head to Miss Gruss's class. If you guys want to come up, go for it. Okay, who would like to ask a question? Okay, stand up, kick in and ask. Um, how many pictures do you think she took? Oh, so, um, uh, you know, I might take two or 300 pictures on a dive like when it's really exciting and new like this for me and then I might keep maybe 20 of them per dive and on a trip like that I might do like 20 dives so uh, lots of dives and the average dive what we call run time so time from when I leave the boat to when I'm back on the boat was um, two to two and a half hours each dive on this trip. Mm -hmm. I love the question. I don't think we've ever gotten that one for you before. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. And my longest dive in life was 22 hours. So, <laughs> yeah. so that, that's, that's using the re breather technology we're talking about, correct? Mm -hmm. you couldn't mm -hmm. do that without that. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Uh, let's head to Miss Elliot's class. We've got their tech working halfway through. <laughs> Come on up, guys. Um, hi, my name is Gabby. Did you, uh, or how many people were on, uh, were diving with you? And did you ever get scared? Yeah. yeah, so uh, on this trip, trip, there were 12 of us diving. Um, so sometimes I dive alone even, um, and then sometimes I'm on a much larger group. Maybe I think the most people I've ever been in the water with at once on a like working together as a group was 18 people inside a cave when we were shooting a Hollywood movie. <laughs> now, gr my favorite question of all is, aren't you scared? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Now, people think that I'm fearless because I'm an explorer, but it's really important actually to be scared because it means that you care about the outcome of your choices. It means that you understand that you're doing something that's risky. And um, I like to tell people that walking towards fear is a really good thing. It's part of being an explorer because if something scares you, it means that you're on the edge of doing something that may be new for you or maybe completely new for humanity and that that little you know heart heart rate racing or or fear that you feel uh just means that you care about the outcome of your choices and that you want to be safe so being scared is good and i would say walk towards fear rather than running from it we can always figure out how to deal with things that scare us if we just make a list of what those risks are Amazing. Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad we got that question so early. That's great. Yeah. Um, all right, Miss Keller's class just came back, but while they're getting their tech working, I'm going to take a question from the YouTube group. So Miss Katzko's class wanted to ask, what inspired you to do underwater diving, Jill? Well, um, I actually wanted to be an astronaut when I was a little kid. Um, I watched the Apollo missions um, when I was a, when I was a young girl. And um, we didn't have a Canadian space program or, or women astronauts. <laughs> but I also used to watch Jacques Cousteau on TV and that really inspired me. And I, I realized that the oceans and the water places on our planet were really unexplored. And for me, that was a huge opportunity. So that's sort of what drove it for me. But, but I was also a real water kid. I like to swim. I like to like springboard dive, synchronized swimming, paddle a canoe. And so diving was sort of a natural extension. So Miss Katzo, I may see you in Calgary in a couple of days at the teacher conference. <laughs> I'm going to be, yeah, yeah, I'm going to be speaking there uh, this week. Yeah. And Edmonton. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned being a, a water kid, and I wanted to stress, because I think all our classes are the right age. Can you tell the classes at what age they can start learning to scuba dive? Yeah. So even as young as eight, you can participate in something called a bubble maker program, um, which is like pool diving. But once you're 10, you can get fully certified as a scuba diver uh, by taking a series of classroom and pool sessions and then doing four dives in the open water. Um, and that's how you become a, a junior scuba diver. 
and and you can continue to go through like higher uh, levels of, of learning like advanced scuba and rescue diver and all kinds of things after that so many many opportunities very cool all right uh, miss keller's class i know you guys had to dip out for a bit i don't know what the tech difficulties were but you're back and so if you guys have a question in miss keller's group and you wanted to come up and ask jill go for it okay. mm -hmm. we do indeed go ahead and get part of the screen What's the strangest thing that you've ever seen? Oh. Like, what's the strangest object that you've ever seen? Yeah. Well, I've seen, um, in terms of like, like things underwater, I've seen um, human skeletons. <laughs> so um, ritually sacrificed human beings in Mexico um, that would have been sacrificed like, you know, a long, long time ago, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of years ago and left... Um, like in caves that are now filled with water. So that's pretty unusual. Uh, but I've also found unusual animals in caves. So there are things that swim around in the darkness of an underwater cave that are like living swimming dinosaurs because, uh, but they're tiny uh, because they've been around on earth unchanged for tens of millions of years. And so some of those animals are quite unusual like animals with venomous fangs and pincers and uh, cool stuff. But miniature animals <laughs> cool <laughs> that's the only ritualized human skeleton conversation that we're going to have the entire month of february so thank you probably yeah, yeah. <laughs> now in the in the wrecks that i was just in in truck we saw the most the craziest stuff everything from giant bombs to landmines uh, but also trucks tanks guns um and then you know like i said the bottles um and then any kind of you like supply that you could possibly imagine is packed inside of those ships too, like water tanks and all kinds of things. These ships are so big that they're just full of things. But but we also see like like the old cabins, um, like so there are bathrooms, so there's bathtubs and toilets and sinks, <laughs> you know, that you see and, and suddenly become kind of interesting when you see them underwater. <laughs> Thank you again. Um, yeah. All right, let's go back to Ms. Collins' class. We'll do another round of questions, guys. This is very cool. Come on up. How far have you been underwater? Well, um, the deepest, deepest vertical like that I've ever been down is like 460 feet beneath the surface. But I've been, you know, more than, uh, you know, miles inside of cave systems that branch out like, like branches of a tree. So miles inside these water-filled conduits so that in order to get out of there and back to the surface I have to swim a couple miles before I can even come up so so I've actually gone further into deep caves than any woman um, has ever gone before. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I'm going to take a quick YouTube question from Ms. Castro's class. Yeah. How long do you study in one area for? Well, um, it's, well th th there's double double question there. You might be surprised to learn that my formal background in university is in fine arts. <laughs> and I have a very deep uh, curiosity for all things science, but I am not formally a scientist. I'm a citizen scientist. And so I collaborate with scientists. And so every project for me is new. Like when I go to Antarctica and try to cave dive inside an iceberg, Nobody's ever done that before, but I do spend a lot of time studying about the ice and how that works. You know, when I go to a place like Truck Lagoon, then I've got to get out the history books and learn about um, about that. So, so there's always always something you know driving a new quest for for learning, and that's what I love about this job. In terms of the actual diving education, there are many, many le levels of diving education. And so I would say that I'm still learning. I, I started to dive more than 30 years ago and I'm still learning all the time because when you're doing something that hasn't been done before, sometimes you got to write the handbook to <laughs> figure things out and teach others. She is going to have to come to that teacher conference. I think it's set in Yeah, I think everybody uh, is. Yeah, so okay. well, <laughs> yeah. we'll turn some flights and we're yeah. done. Yeah. Um, let's go back to, to Busiris and Miss Gross's class. Do you guys have another question? Go for it. Um, so my very first dive was in Ontario, Canada when I got certified. 
my my first big expedition was um, back in uh, 1995, <laughs> so a long time ago, and that was uh, when I was participating with the United States deep caving team, um, searching for what we thought might be the world's deepest vertical cave uh, in Mexico. So that was my first real big expedition. Was it the world's deepest vertical cave? Did they discover? No, we're still duking it out. So there's oh. a cave in the UK, Ukraine, and then there's caves in Mexico. Um, that are constantly duking it out. It is the deepest cave in the Western Hemisphere, though. So okay, we'll take that. Uh, does it take that? This one. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, Miss Elliot's class, come on back up, guys. Um, have you ever found any treasure, and have you ever kept any of it? <laughs> Great question. So. Um, we don't take anything either out of the caves or off of shipwrecks uh, because we think that anything that's underwater should stay there, both both because it's an important part of history and culture and also because it's probably uh, best conserved there as well. Now the shipwrecks are gonna disappear and dissolve back into the ocean because it's salt water, but, uh, but those are grave sites. 5,000 people died in Operation Hailstone and so, so we treat these sites with great respect and we don't want to disturb anything. Uh, in caves, you know, everything from human remains to like cultural uh, resources, pottery, things we might find underwater, uh, we, we also leave behind because it stays very well conserved in place. So we actually scan a lot of these kinds of things and bring home digital data instead of the objects. Um, so uh, treasure hunting is kind of frowned upon in, in my business. Although there was one time I was inside a very recent wreck and I found a big wad of cash. <laughs> so I got to keep that. Yeah. <laughs> no gold doubloons in any cupboards, though, in the background. No, there. but about $320 in cash. <laughs> Perfect. We'll take it. You're going to buy a, buy a pirate treasure for that. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, let's head back to Miss Keller's class and then uh, go from there. What do you do when you're not diving? Um, well, I have a lot of hobbies. I really like outdoor stuff. So I live near Ottawa, Canada. So right now in the wintertime, I'm skiing and snowshoeing or, or hiking. Um, in the summertime, I like cycling and swimming. Um, but it's funny, I, uh, like if I'm not working diving, I still like fun diving. So it's, um, it's a pretty good career for me. <laughs> It's something we hear from a lot of our, our speakers is that uh, the things that drive them, the things that they end up doing for a living are stuff that they've been passionate about since they were a little kid and they just get to do that and it's not really work when you're just fulfilling what you yeah. love. That's yeah. the best kind of job. <laughs> All right. Uh, question from a group on YouTube is Katsuo's class again. Um, is the color on the coral from algae? Can you explain a little bit about how Ooh. colorful coral is? Yeah. So... Uh, there are a lot of really, really colorful things underwater. Uh, and if we don't shine a light on them, we don't actually notice that it's colorful because uh, as we go deeper and deeper, the, the light is absorbed and then um, and also refracted. Um, and so until we shine a light on the stuff, it actually looks kind of blue green monotone. And then as soon as we shine a light on it, it's like, whoa. It's beautiful, uh, and and chuk uh, is some of the most colorful things that I've seen. There are colorful al algaes down there, but there are also colorful sponges and corals and sea whips and sea fans and all kinds of marine life. Most of this are, although they're they're anchored, they're animals, um, and so that's kind of interesting too. Fantastic. All right. Uh, Jill, do you have another uh, time for another round of four questions? Yes, yes. Perfect. All right. Well, in that case, let's go back to Ms. Collins' group. Come on up, guys. I challenge each class to have a girl ask a question. It is the International Day of Women in STEM, so I want to make sure we yeah, get yeah. questions for girls, too. <laughs> yeah, you're good. Did you ever explore the Titanic? I haven't been to the Titanic. Um, it's very, very deep, so we can't actually swim around the Titanic. We can only explore it with submarines because it's so deep. Uh, I would love to go there, but very expensive to get a submarine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People are still exploring the Titanic. People still go down there. 
Yes. So a friend of mine is, was actually scheduled to go to the Titanic this year, but it looks like there's a new effort uh, to stop people from just casually going like they don't want it to become a tourist destination um, because they want to protect it. Uh, it it's you know an important historical site as well so we'll see what happens they may be sort of you know closing the space around it um, and leaving it just for science which is interesting this is something that we've covered in a bunch of our presentations in the last couple of months is these famous sites whether it's machu picchu whether it's uh cave, yeah. crystal caves in mexico are starting to be realized that, that they're really precious and that intense yeah. tourism intense people going there uh you know get rid of the scientific aspect, get rid of the, the yeah. future generation. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, all right, let's head back to Bucyrus. Uh, Ms. Gross's class, come on up. Have you ever gotten lost? OK, that's a great question, too. Uh, in caves, what we do is we take a, a reel. Um, in fact, it looks like this, right? And we rerun the line through the cave. So very carefully, like tying it off around rocks and things like that. We do the same thing inside of wrecks. Uh, and that's so that if we lose all the visibility, which can happen um, from silt in the water, then I could just put my hands around the guideline and follow it all the way back to the entrance. So that's, that's what we do to prevent ourselves from, from getting lost. If someone didn't run a guideline and then got caught in this sort of white out of silt, it would be easy to get lost. So that's a really important safety protocol for us running a line. Yeah. Is there a backup in case the line tears? No, um, but we do train and practice to both find a guideline when we're blind. So like search techniques for finding the guideline if we can't see. And then we also practice underwater patching the guideline. So we, you know, practice that blindfolded, um, putting in a, a patch and tying the right knots so that it's secure and gets us back out of the cave. Very good. All right. Um, let's go back to Ms. Elliott's second last question. And uh, yeah, guys, this is great. When astronauts uh, get back from space, they have to recover. Do divers have to recover? That's a great question. Right now, I'm just recovering from the jet lag. <laughs> but yes, so when we dive, we're under pressure, right? So the weight of the seawater is pressing against our body and our bodies actually absorb inert gas. So our bodies metabolize oxygen, but we have no use for the other gases that are in the mix, which, which can be more than 80% of the rest of the gas. So helium and nitrogen gases get pressed into our tissues. So tiny bubbles get dissolved into our tissues. And the deeper down we go, the more that gas that gets pressed into our tissues. So we become kind of like a soda pop bottle with the cap on. As we come up, we have to come up very slowly. And that's like, like taking the soda um, cap off very slowly so that the pressure doesn't erupt from the soda pop. Same thing can happen in our bodies. So we come up very, very slowly in order to let that extra nitrogen and helium out. But then once we're on the surface, we have to kind of take it easy before our bodies get back to equilibrium. And when, when we finish diving on a trip, we also have to wait 24 hours before we can fly in an airplane because an airplane is at ease even less pressure. And so more of those gas bubbles could come out of my body when I went up into the airplane. So it takes another 24 hours to completely off gas enough so that we can make a flight home. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes we're also tired <laughs> too. So that's, that's all about sort of the recovery from, from breathing those gases under pressure. Awesome. Great I, question. Yeah, I don't think we've ever got that question exactly like that before. So yeah, that's good. a good one. Um, all right, I lied. We're going to take two more questions because yeah, there's a good one on YouTube. The YouTube question is, have you discovered any cave paintings, Jill? Any cave paintings? Yeah. Uh, so nothing with like pictures uh, that I've discovered. I've seen them in caves. I've seen um, areas in an underwater cave that appear to be like washed with a paint, like with a red paint. Uh, and, and we don't know exactly what that's all about. Um, so yeah, I have seen places where it was probably painted when the cave was dry and then the cave later filled with, with water. Yeah. Very cool. All right. 
Well, we'll wrap up with one last question from Ms. Keller's class. If you guys want to come up and, and end us off, go for it. Have you ever had an encounter with the shark? Yeah, so I see a lot of sharks. I saw sharks last week when we were down in, in Chuuk. Uh, I've even seen sharks at the doorways of caves when I came out. Uh, sharks, are, like you're a whole lot more likely to die of a fatal accident while bowling than you are <laughs> to be bitten by a shark, even if you're a diver like me. Uh, because as soon as I see a shark, uh, usually when I'm going, wow, a shark, the shark is going, oh my gosh, a human, and they're swimming away as fast as they can. They're terrified of us. Um, so sharks are in much more danger from humans that are fishing them for shark fins, for instance. Um, and uh, we're in very little danger from sharks. The only shark attacks that happen are kind of accidental things. When the shark looks up from below and sees maybe a swimmer or someone on a surfboard, and to them, it looks like the shadow of a seal, something that's in their, in their food plan, um, where we don't look like, smell like, or taste like anything in their food plan. So that's why you know the occasional surfer or something gets bitten, and then the shark goes, bleh don't like that, sorry, <laughs> and spits them out. Um, so sharks have a bad reputation. We actually love seeing sharks underwater. Yeah, uh, we do presentations with a woman named Christina Zanotto who does really fantastic shark outreach and information. So I, I encourage class to check that out. Yeah. I also love the analogy. Mine has always been uh, vending machines. I crush more people than sharks every year, but I like bowling accidents. That's a good one. Oh, okay. Vending machines. I'm going to remember that. <laughs> Co coconuts is like 40 and sharks are like five or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, fantastic questions, guys. Jill, before we wrap up, uh, is there a place that we can send kids to learn more about you, the work you do, yeah. or to encourage to dive in general? Absolutely. Uh, well, you can go to my website, intotheplanet.com, and there's a lot of like links to my different experts explorations as well as my youtube pages and vimeo and things like that so there's a lot more to uh to watch there um there's also an app um that i recently uh, uh did work on for a film that's that's out called under thin ice it's a film about climate change and diving in the arctic under the sea ice and the app which is free is on um uh, either the uh, App Store or Google Play. It's called uh, Discover the Arctic. And uh, if you want to have a look at that, there's some more interesting stuff to, to see. Yeah, so I'll pass along all those resources to our class when we're done. I, I really appreciate that, Jill. That's fantastic. Um, all right, Jill, as you know, how we wrap all these up is I'm going to demute every class's microphone. And so boys and girls in all our classes, if you guys can get ready to join me and say a huge thank you to Jill for joining us today. You are all now demuted. Go for it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys, to all our class for joining us for a really special presentation and a really special month for us. Uh, and for Jill for coming in on the International Day of Women in STEM and coming back from an exploration literally within like 24 hours. It's amazing. Yeah. We're so thrilled to have you. Awesome. Thanks.